Welcome to Think Tech on Spectrum OC16, Hawaii's weekly newscast on things that matter to tech and to Hawaii. I'm Jay Fidel. And I'm Elise Anderson. In our show this time, we'll review the most recent top five Think Tech talk shows and staff pick. We'll check out the elements of the best of the best and get a handle on the public issues and the guests involved. Think Tech produces more than 35 talk shows every week in our downtown high tech green screen studio. Our Think Tech talk show offerings are very diverse and their coverage is also very diverse, covering things you might never have otherwise known. Every week, Think Tech chooses its top five Think Tech talk shows from the week before based on the number of views each of them has had on the internet. For this past week, the winning shows were as follows. Number one, from the series Business in Hawaii, hosted by Ray Tsuchiyama, it's called Hawaii's Ninth Island, Las Vegas, with guest Reg Baker. Reg Baker began his accounting and business consulting career in Honolulu. Along the way, he reached out to small firms and military veterans. He's a Vietnam veteran himself. He has also done business in Las Vegas and recently moved back there. The show covered business factors that make Vegas different and make it a business environment for Hawaii business entrepreneurs and firms. What is the uh, population? Is it families or retired people or uh, active uh, business people or younger people? What's the mix there? All of the above. Uh, there's a, a big community of retired people here because of the tax structure and the weather. Uh, we compete with Arizona for that retirement community recognition. Uh, but there's also a, a growing family community. Matter of fact, the majority of the people who live in the Vegas Valley uh, rarely, if ever, go to the Strip. They, uh, just like Waikiki, there's a lot of people that live around Waikiki that never really go to Waikiki. Right. That's they true. And very similar to here in the Vegas Valley. Any changes that you've seen uh, for your now, uh, you know, coming back to Nevada? You know, Ray, I've seen a lot of change. I started coming here in the 90s when I bought some property out here uh, for myself and my clients, and I did a lot of traveling back and forth. So I, I've been here through the first rise in the economy and then the first where the economy broke, uh, and now it's back again. So I've seen the, the different cycles over the last 20 years. Um, but one thing that is a constant is that it's constantly growing. Uh, yes, to, to all of that, the, the casinos, the gaming is huge. But also remember, in, in Vegas, there's a division between the gaming industry and the resort industry, the hotel okay. industry. So you know, both of them are two different types of industries, although they do work well together. So a big visitor industry is out here. There's a big gaming industry. You've got all of the support that those industries need to have, particularly in the technology right. area right. and the construction and the maintenance right. area. Um, but then you've also got a big military presence right. here and all of those support functions that need to be in place. Uh, and because of the, the, the cost structure, uh, you've got companies like uh, Tesla, that are opening up big battery manufacturing in North Las Vegas. You've got Google opening up uh, data centers down in uh, Henderson. Uh, there's just a, a lot of different larger companies finding both the lower cost of doing business, but also the, the lower tax structure that exists here, all beneficial for them to set up operations here. Number two, from the series Security Matters Hawaii, hosted by Andrew Lanning. It's called The Security Industry, A Year in Review, Because Security Matters, with guest Bill Bozeman. The discussion covered the highlights and changes that took place in the electronic security industry in 2018, with some predictions on things to come in 2019. This episode helped us gain insight into emerging trends that drive the electronic security industries in a greater manufacturer and workforce development.
Number three, from the series Likeable Science, hosted by Ethan Allen. It's called Where's the Water? Groundwater Use, Outreach, Verification, and Compliance on Maui and Molokai, with guest Kevin Gooding. The project they covered involved outreach, well verification, and advice to owners. In 2017, about 25% of the wells on Molokai and 33% of the wells on Maui reported reduced water use. The Commission on Water Resource Management is funding and managing this project. Reporting water usage data is important because it's the law and because we need this data for science and water management to protect water and the appropriate use of our water resources. Water is a public resource in Hawaii. We need to cooperate and share information to protect that resource. Again, this is a sort of complex interplay of these unknowns, right? We do know how much we're pumping out. We don't know exactly how much is in the big sponge of the island, and we don't. We have some vague guess about its replenishment rate, right? Exactly. Yeah. That's why we always need more water resources data. Right, and and uh, but clearly, I mean, one, we all need water just to live, right? You can, you know, you can live three minutes without air, or three days without water, and thirty days without food, right? And uh, so we don't want the taps all one day just running dry, right? We need to know. What's happening, and are our groundwater levels changing in some way? Right. We need to know, and and this water use uh, data collection is is a very personal way of knowing it. Right. Really, the only way is to go out and and visit each well owner because mm -hmm. they don't know that right. the, they don't know that they're required by law to report water. Right. They don't know the reasons why that it's because of what we've been talking right. about. So I have I I talk with their, all five hundred of them. Are you seeing trends? I think it's good trends. Really? Okay. I think things are equalizing and old inequities are, are being repaired gradually. Oh, okay. A lot of his traditional and customary uses that were neglected for um, decades. And they're coming, at least the opportunity to do it is coming back. Excellent. So, yeah, I know on Maui there's big issues because their agriculture sort of, some of their big agricultural areas basically have stopped being sugarcane producers or pineapple producers or whatever. Now, presumably, they don't need all that water to irrigate all those crops. Can they return it now so that the stream flows can re return to what they used to be? And they are. They're right. returning, a, restoring a lot of streams. Okay. Ah, that's excellent. And streams are pretty resilient, actually. They'll, even after decades of low flow, they'll, they'll come back. I know uh, they recently did this in the mouth of the Colorado River and started releasing water there for the first time in <laughs> probably four decades. And, and the delta came blooming back, apparently, the first year they did it. Uh, rather strongly, they were, they were, people were very surprised uh, how much how much it was ready to spring back into life. Well, they're studying those streams. Oh. Um, East Maui, I've been working in Nahiku a lot and looking oh. at wells there.
Number four from the series Much More on Medicine, hosted by Craig Thomas. It's called Wahiwa General Hospital, serving the health care needs of Central Oahu and beyond, with guests Tom Forney and Brian Sheplick. It covered the history, the status, and the future at Wahiwa General Hospital, including the broad spectrum of outpatient and inpatient services and real-time telemedicine offered at Wahiwa. Over time, um as specialties and diagnostic uh, capabilities evolved in medicine, uh, roles of hospitals changed, and hospitals changed a lot. And in hospitals like Wahiwa, uh, the, the emergency department really is the focus. It's 90% uh, plus, it, probably close to 100% of all admissions, and this is true across the state, um, go through the emergency department. Uh, in addition, the emergency department, which sees somewhere in the 20,000 plus range of patients per year uh, is what most people see at the hospital. Yeah. Uh, there, of course, is, uh, and Brian's going to share with us some of the other services, but uh, there's an inpatient uh, facility, there's intensive care, and there's a uh, skilled nursing facility uh, adjacent to it. So it yeah. provides a spectrum of services. As you mentioned, uh, starting to expand service lines. Um, probably of, of the most significance is. Uh, um, working on building out uh, another specialty clinic. Uh, there's a number of specialists who are, are looking at wanting to come to Wahiwa and provide their specialty services um, uh, to Wahiwa and the patients who live in both central Oahu and North Shore. Um, and so that's coming out over the, the coming months of finalizing the, the building and the renovations so that we can uh, provide extra services uh, for all of our patients in the community. We've been pleasantly surprised at how many specialists are and have approached Wahiwa and said, hey, I, I want to bring my care out to Wahiwa. Let's, uh, let's figure out how to make that happen. So it's, it's been wonderful. That's exciting. Yeah, we, we brought, um, <clears throat> actually, I think they had a group of physicians that came out and visited last week. We just wanted to kind of show them the space because as you, said, as you talked about a little bit earlier, do we have the space for it? We actually do. We have the space allocated for it already at the hospital. It's a matter of making it conducive so that the physicians can provide the level of care they need to. But thankfully, we have the space available. Um, I think they like what they saw. Um, it's a matter of getting all the ducks in a row. It takes a little while, as you know. Things can be a little bit slow, but just making sure that we do it the right way so that we provide the right type of care the community needs. And so that, that, that um, hopefully, will be happening pretty soon. Number five from the series Energy 808, The Cutting Edge. I was the host. It's called Renewables Coming Clean in 2019. Lots of developments and prospects in Hawaii. With guest Marco Mangelsdorf. The show involved a discussion about the prospects of renewables in Hawaii in 2019, including Puna Geothermal Venture, Huhonua, projects planned to bring new megawatts of solar and storage online, current and anticipated solar permit counts, tax credits for storage, the R word, resiliency, and the C word, curtailments. The episode helped us get a handle on our expanding energy technology and markets going forward. One more point about who Honua is that that contract that would have, was approved in May of 2017 was I believe for 22 cents a kilowatt hour all in, which is really high compared to what solar plus storage is coming in at. And interestingly, one of the HELCO engineers in, in testimony to the PUC as part of the 6,000 page document dump that HELCO did recently as they're requesting the second base rate increase in two years of the commission. The HELCO engineer, for the first time that I've ever seen, Jay, actually described solar plus storage is going in Hawaii as, quote, dispatchable power dispatchable power. And that to me is a big deal because one of the slams with solar has been, well, it's, it's non-firm, it's not dispatchable. And, and dispatchable means, by the way, in, in grid parlance, that uh, a dispatchable source of electricity is one that, that can be used on demand and dispatched at the request of the grid operators. That means you have to incentivize storage every time you get a chance. Um, to, to get to get it at, at parity. So, you know, for every kilowatt that's generated uh, by PV, you've got to have battery to hold it for the appropriate period of time. Query, what is the status of those incentives right now, Marco? As I understand it, the IRS allows for the 30% investment tax credit, which has been around since George W. Bush days of 2005, which begins uh, a ramp down, by the way, in 2020. So we have 30% this year and 30% next year in 2019, and then it starts to ramp down in 20, 
20 and, and, and thereafter. So as I understand it, the IRS allows for the 30% ITC to include storage. Now in the 18 years that I've been involved with Hawaiian Electric, they have kind of done the dance back and forth, round and round at times in terms of, do we want to be in the ownership business of, of generation in terms of solar? And they kind of get to the brink and they pull back and they get to the brink and they pull back. Well, they finally went over the brink in terms of buying, you know, to a, a modest 20 megawatts again, if I remember correctly. But I do not believe that it is Hawaiian Electric's intent or goal to get into the ownership business of utility scale solar and battery storage they believe that it's in their better interest and the ratepayers interest to have somebody else pay for it and enter into a long-term power purchase agreement that is advantageous to the utility therefore advantageous to rate okay well that's a choice i mean but i think what you said and which does answer my my question is that they go to these third parties and they say in the contract we want you to not only do solar we want you to do storage so go out and do it we also have a staff pick from the series Condo Insider, hosted by Richard Emery and Yuriko Sugimura. It's called New Fire Sprinkler Bill. It's not over yet. A new fire sprinkler bill is in the works for Hawaii condo owners. Since the last bill regulating fire sprinklers in Hawaii condominiums and high-rises failed to pass, condo owners, legislators, and emergency personnel have been working hard to come up with an alternative. The fight goes on for new legislation regulating fire sprinklers in high-rises and condominiums. I was looking at published statistics by the Honolulu Fire Department. And I don't remember them word for word, but my numbers will be pretty accurate. In the last 10 years, we've had over 300 residential fires of single family homes and about 30 deaths. If you take the last 10 years in what I call multifamily living high rises, we've had maybe five bill fires with only one of those fires, Marco Polo, resulting in four deaths. Yes. Now, how come we're being picked on? Well, I think a lot of associations would agree with you that we're getting picked on, that condos and uh, uh, co-ops are being picked on. And, and, I mean, we're the target. I mean, it's easier, it's easier to target us than to target single-family homes uh, for fire sprinklers. And I guess now the new homes have uh, uh, fire sprinklers in them. It's just that they, you know, it's almost taboo. You don't want to touch retrofitting single family homes. But for us, uh, you know, uh, retrofitting high rises always seems to be an issue because it was the issue uh, back in 2005, you know, when we had that American Savings Bank fire. Think of it this way they have to have this done in three years, all right? right? and nobody's giving you proposals, yet the fire department's amending the matrix, so we don't really know what we're supposed to do. Right. Heaven be the association that, because it, they couldn't get it done, because there's only so many people who do this work, has the fire that came after the three-year obligation, but before the matrix was done, because nobody would do it. I mean, it's gonna be a legal mess. Right, and, and like I said, the clock is ticking, and Bill 72 did extend the first you know, deadline of three years to five years, basically because uh, it was, un, you know, because of the uncertainty that was uh, posed by the uh, professionals who were tasked to do, doing the life safety evaluation. I mean, they kept saying, well, you know, we're not really sure what we're supposed to be doing. And because of that, uh, you know, it, it, right now, we have less than three years because it's three years from the date of enactment. Enactment happened on May 3rd. Okay, so that's May, June, July, August, September, October, November. We're seven months. We're almost eight months into the first year. You can always find the links to these shows in our daily email advisories. If you don't already get our daily email advisories, you can sign up to get them on thinktechhawaii.com. These are only samplings from the top five and the staff pick from across our 35 weekly talk shows. There are, of course, many more. To see these top five and staff pick shows in their entirety, go to thinktechhawaii.com or youtube.com slash thinktechhawaii. Great diversity, great community, great content at ThinkTech. If you have questions or comments about these or any of our shows, please let us know. And yes, it's okay to share them with your friends and colleagues. Thanks so much for watching our shows and for supporting our efforts at ThinkTech.
And now let's check out our ThinkTech schedule of events going forward. ThinkTech broadcasts its talk shows live on the internet from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. on weekdays. Then we broadcast our earlier shows all night long and on the weekends. And some people listen to them all night long and on the weekends. If you missed a show or if you want to replay or share any of our shows, they're all archived on demand on ThinkTechHawaii.com and YouTube. For our audio stream, go to ThinkTechHawaii.com slash audio. And we post all our shows as podcasts on iTunes. Visit thinktechhawaii.com for our weekly calendar and live streaming YouTube links. Or better yet, sign up on our email list to get our daily email advisories. ThinkTech has a high-tech green screen studio at Pioneer Plaza. If you want to see it or be part of our live audience, or if you want to participate in our shows, contact shows at thinktechhawaii.com. If you want to pose a question or make a comment during a show, call 808 374 2014 and help us raise public awareness on ThinkTech. Go ahead, give us a thumbs up on YouTube or send us a tweet at ThinkTechHI. We'd like to know how you feel about the issues and events that affect our lives in these islands and in this country. We want to stay in touch with you. We'd like you to stay in touch with us. Let's think together. We'll be right back to wrap up this week's edition of Think Tech. But first, we want to thank our underwriters. Okay, Elise, that wraps up this week's edition of ThinkTech. Remember, you can watch ThinkTech on Spectrum OC16 several times every week. Can't get enough of it, just like Elise does. For additional times, check out OC16.tv. For lots more ThinkTech videos and for underwriting and sponsorship opportunities on ThinkTech, visit ThinkTechHawaii.com. Be a guest or a host, a producer or an intern, and help us reach and have an impact on Hawaii. Thanks so much for being part of our Think Tech family and for supporting our open discussion of tech, energy, diversification, and global awareness in Hawaii. And of course, the ongoing search for innovation wherever we can find it. You can watch this show throughout the week and tune in next Sunday evening for our next important Think Tech episode. I'm Jay Fidel. And I'm Elise Anderson. Aloha, everyone. Mm -hmm.